Hallelujah. We are thrilled beyond words to see you today and to have you here on the campus on this first Monday of this school year, which is the first year of the history of this college. Brother Dwayne Temple, the chairman of the Music and Drama Department, is coming to lead us in worship. Let's enter into his presence with praise and thanksgiving. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Yes, he has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is worship you today from deep within our hearts we worship you with all of our hearts today we sense your wonderful tender presence and we worship you and we pray today 
Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We worship you, Father, for we have come into your presence and we feel that anointing of your Holy Spirit. And we praise you today and we believe you today, God, that you will work in our lives and that you will bless this great work, that you will bless the Jimmy Swaggart Ministries today, that you will bless the college today. Oh, God, we worship and praise and adore you today. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. We bless your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God's presence is here in such a beautiful way. And you know why his presence is here? It's because he came with us. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Spirit in your life and he's in my life and all of us on the platform today. I want Brother Evans, Pastor Evans, to come up here and lead us in prayer. You may have special needs upon your heart today. Many of you are here only because, and maybe all of you, because God worked some very special miracles this summer and for some of you this week. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'll never forget the first time I went off to Bible college and how God worked miracles to get me there. Someday I will tell one of those stories. But I sense and I know that you are here under a divine appointment of the Lord. It is not by accident, but by God's sovereign will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Many of you have things in your heart that you know that God needs to do in your life so that you can go ahead and accomplish God's will for your life. And I tell you probably if you're typical Bible college students, you would say, I need some financial miracles. <laughs> you're going to face that business office tomorrow. And we're believing God with you. You have a great responsibility to be faithful to your business obligations but our God is faithful also. I want you to know that. Hallelujah. 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 I want you to reach over and join hands with the ones to your left and right and cross the aisles if you would. I want the faculty and administration to join hands. And this dear pastor who has a son here, his son was the first one to check into the residence hall, Jason. We're proud of that. Pastor Evans supports this ministry, supports this college, and we thank God for it. Pastor, lead us to prayer today and for our students today, would you? Father, we just thank you today Hallelujah. from the depth of our hearts, O oh God, that you ever sent Jesus, your Son, to give his precious life for us. First of all, Father, this morning we thank you for our salvation through Christ. We thank you, Lord, that he left heaven's glory to come into this sin-sick world and live as a man amongst us and yet without sin, finally coming to that place called Calvary. There he gave his precious lifeblood that we might be redeemed, that we might be saved from our sin. No, oh God, we thank you today. How we thank you today, Lord, for our salvation. We're such a privileged people, Lord. Oh, God, help us to appreciate our salvation through Christ today. Help us, Lord, never to become complacent and take for granted this glorious and marvelous and wonderful gift that you've given us. God, we want to thank you today for every one of these students here this morning. God, how our hearts are thrilled when we realize, oh God, the potential that is here. 
God, we see amongst them, O oh God, already in our mind's eye, missionaries, evangelists, pastors, teachers, administrators. God, we see them in our mind's eye. And, oh God, we thank you for every one of them this morning. We ask you, Lord, that you bless each one of them. God, some of them we know, Father, may have burdens upon their hearts today. Maybe they've come, oh God, from homes, oh Father, that have been broken by sin. We think of those today, oh God, maybe that have left homes, Father, where their parents don't understand what they're doing. God, I pray today that you minister to those students. I pray, oh God, that you might be their father today, that you might be their mother, that you might be their brother, that you might be their sister that would embrace them and take them in their arms, your arms today. God, for those today maybe that are facing, yes, that financial problem, God, I pray that you'll undertake. For we know, oh God, that there is not one problem, one difficulty that you cannot solve if we'll only but trust you oh God bless I pray this college God we know we know Lord that this is only the commencement of something so great that we cannot begin even to comprehend it God I pray today that you bless the faculty bless Dr. Gray I pray oh God as he leads God, I pray in Jesus' name that you pour in divine strength, O oh Father. Physically, mentally, spiritually, and in every way, O oh God, I pray that you minister to him today. Minister to every member of the faculty. We lift up again, Brother Swaggett. We ask you, O oh God, that your divine hand of protection will be upon him. God, we realize that in a few days, O oh Father, he will be facing again that great, great vast crowd of people that will gather in Madison Square God save New York City oh God save New York City oh God move I pray oh God in an unprecedented way I pray in Jesus name bless your servant as he goes there Lord I pray that you give him such great unction great anointing I pray God I pray that by your spirit oh father you will save thousands of people in New York City thousands of people in New York City God I pray that you move oh God in the Northeast I pray oh God that your spirit oh God might sweep through New England God I ask you today that you move by your spirit and bless oh father Brother Jimmy Swaggett and all of his staff and all of those that will take part in that great crusade. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. And it's for your glory, Lord, for your glory. Amen. Amen. Bless God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Turn around and share your love with one with another for just a moment. We don't encourage the men to hug the women or the women to hug the men, but you certainly can express Christian love. Unless you're married, that's okay. There are so many wonderful things about this ministry that you're going to enjoy while you're here on these 130 acres. But I think one of the ministries and part of this ministry is a man that has a wonderful gift and anointing to minister in song. And he is a wonderful role model for those of you that God is leading into a ministry of singing. Brother John Starnes is coming. Welcome him.
gathered in one place Not sure what would happen But like you they were trusting in God's grace Then they got down to pray In blessed one accord The wind and fire that filled that temple It was the presence of the Lord Then one day while I was drifting You know I came to a sacred place And all the people They were singing And they were praising God for His grace And then a stirring so deep within me Just like my mother's, like her sweet embrace It let me know I was in God's presence Yes, he's here right now And you don't need to wait No, you don't need to beg For he's passing out gifts for all to receive and he's here right now to meet every need this this morning is special to me because I never got to go to college like this and I wish somebody would have shared Jesus Christ by his Holy Spirit to me but you're here now and so is Jesus One day, while I was drifting, you know I came to a sacred, holy place. Although I was raised in church, I'd never seen it before. The people, they had their hands lifted up and they were praising God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. And there was something real in that place. And then there came a stirring so deep within me. Just like my mother's, like her sweet, like her sweet embrace. It let me know I was in. God's presence and forever I was safe 
sing it with me. Cause he's here. Thank you, Brother John Starnes. Hallelujah. We've come to a very important part of the launching of this college. We have come to the time when the person that God has raised up to be the founder and the chancellor of the college to address the students from the deep of his heart. I believe that there are a number of people mightily used of God today, but I honestly don't believe that any of them are used any more than the man who is the president of Jimmy Swigert Ministries, the founder and the chancellor of this college. I have been listening to him preach for many years, and he has never deviated from the straight, forward, full gospel message. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God has given Brother Swigert an incredible platform of preaching to millions by television and thousands and thousands in crusades. Just think, this coming weekend, a great, great crusade will be in New York City. And 25, 30, 40,000 people will be there and will hear the message and the power of God. Let me say this sincerely to the students. We're delighted for some parents to be with us, and it's only appropriate that you're here. But students, you are blessed beyond words. Blessed beyond words. And I mean that so sincerely. I believe that you know that. Only once in a generation does this kind of a thing happen. But I believe that Brother Swaggart is God's man of this hour and that God has given him the message of the hour. You can listen to all the messages that you hear. But when this man takes the pulpit, you know that he's been close to the throne of God. Amen. You know it. And you know that his heart and his soul 
is weeping and crying for this nation and the nations of the world. I know that you're in for a treat this year and the years that you will be with us. This college would not even be possible if it were not for the fact that this large ministry was able to launch it and put it together. I want to say this to all the students. What you're paying your tuition and your board and room is less than one-third what it is costing Brother Swigert to bring you here and to educate you. Less than one-third. And he is doing that because God has called him to do it. Aren't you glad that he agreed to do it? Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I want you to show your love and to receive warmly. I think the greatest preacher in all the world, a man that I am so privileged to work with, the founder and chancellor of this college, Reverend Jimmy Swigert. Would you reach out to him? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Give him praise and glory. He's the one that deserves all praise, all glory. Hallelujah. Amen. I, Jesus. You may be seated. Thank you, Dr. Gray. I, I, I don't want to say what Brother Greenaway said last night, but nothing fits more appropriately. But God forgive him for saying all that. <laughs> and forgive me for liking it. <laughs> you know, I, I've been in evangelistic work for almost 30 years now, and um, I have so much I want to tell you. And of course, I won't get to be here all the time, but I started in the days I was listening to Dr. Gray's, um, I appreciate all that he said, but I started whenever introductions were flowery, back 30 years ago, 25 years ago. I mean, you know, they, they gave them real big, and evangelists were very prone to that. I mean, it was God's man of faith and power, you know. It was God's man for the hour. It was the man that's touching the world. All of this, these superlatives and adjectives and statements and sayings. And I was in Madison, Wisconsin in a CA convention. And one afternoon they'd had a little skit. And it was a, it was a floor that was wooden. It was hardwood. We was in a big, huge gymnasium. It was thousands there that afternoon night meeting and uh, so I was standing in the corner and I had my Bible and I was God's man of faith and power I was all of it you know and so the announcer went into a 25 minute introduction of me and I was my chest was swelling bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and the greatest camp meeting preacher in the whole world the greatest youth convention speaker on the face of the earth he went on and on and I give to you God's man that he's touched from heaven and that was my cue and I charged out over that floor and in the skit they'd had some rice <laughs> <laughs> rice was all over that floor. I made it to about right there, and my feet went straight up in the air. <laughs> I turned about four somersaults. <laughs> Bible went one way, I went another. Wound up laying flat on my face. And that crowd just stared, you know, this God's man of faith and <laughs> And 
And lying there on the floor, the Holy Ghost said, it's good enough for you. <laughs> I never made another entrance like that. And I, he taught me one more fast, quick, pure lesson. <laughs> I'll never forget that. How do, you, how do you recoup after that, you know? <laughs> you say, praise the Lord, and you're on the floor. <laughs> And you didn't go down gracefully, and you can't get up gracefully. <laughs> it's no way. But uh, I, was, I was looking for the rice whenever Dr. Gray was saying those kind of things. I think, and God, don't let me fall before I get to the pulpit. <laughs> All the glory goes to Jesus Christ. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. <laughs> I've got 25 minutes from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. And I'm so glad to see these pastors. Brother Spike, it's just so good to see you. I kept looking at you and looking at you, and I've, it finally dawned on me. Is that your daughter with you there? I see. Yes. It's so good. I, we knew that she was coming, and just so glad to see you. And always, Don, I appreciate you praying for this crusade in, in Madison Square Garden. Philippians 4, 12 and 13, I know both how to be abased, I know how to abound. Paul is speaking, writing from a prison cell, and first of this book probably started out in a rented house, chained to a Roman soldier in Rome, and some scholars think it ended up with him being in prison, in prison there in a cold cell, still chained to a Roman soldier, writes this which is to be taken back by Epaphroditus to the church at Philippi. He said, I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, uh, both to abound and to suffer need. Now notice this terminology, students. He said, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound, he says it again, and to suffer need. Then he said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I want to use for subject preaching this few minutes, you can do anything you ought to do. You can do anything you ought to do. Last night, no one asked me, and they should not have. I would not have even dared ventured a suggestion had they done so. But if anyone had asked yesterday or day before what subject I would have wanted Charles Greenaway to have addressed himself to last night. It couldn't have been more perfect. That would have been exactly what I would have felt and what I would have wept for, but of course the Holy Ghost does it beautiful and well. And that's exactly what we need to start this college off with, for God to encase you in iron to put a sleeve of iron upon you that you can do that which God wants you to do. Heavenly Father, bless these few words that we would have to say today, opening this session. We ask for your guidance. We ask it all in the holy, holy name of Jesus. And everyone said amen and amen. Every last one of you here this morning are called. Some of you may not be called to the fivefold ministries like apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, but you are called, anyone, everyone that names the name of Jesus, that says, I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb, you have a call upon your heart and life. That call is just as sure and as certain as the call of God is upon my heart and upon the lives of these that are sitting behind me today. <clears throat> Some of you will not know exactly yet what that calling is, what direction that it will take but he has called you. Some of you will not stand with a pulpit ministry, wherever that may be. Some of you will work as secretaries to pastors, you ladies. Some of you will function in other capacities in the local church, but your calling will be very, very important because God has laid his hand upon your life. You may live your life working in secular pursuits to make your earthly living but your true calling will be in another vein. And that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to, everything else comes second. That call upon your heart and your life comes first. Now there, the, 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 the possibility is distinct this morning that some of you here 
have the capacity to literally touch millions of people. I know when I was in a little, when I was a little boy in a little prayer meeting back many, many years ago, about 40 years ago to be exact, uh, my mother was there, my dad was there, Sister McLaughlin was there, my grandmother was there, Mickey Gillies' mother was there, and uh, Mickey was there. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's in country western music now. And uh, maybe a couple of more kids were there. And there was a message and utterance in tongues, that little small prayer meeting in that little woe-be-gone town in northeast Louisiana. And in the utterance, the interpretation given said there was someone there that would touch millions for the cause of Christ. I won't try to say exactly what was said, just paraphrase, and that'll be sufficient. The pastor, Henry W. Culbreth, He's now, I think, in Arkansas, I believe, and he was our pastor, and I loved him dearly, still do. He told me years later, he said, Brother Swaggart, I sat there that day, and he said, and of course, he said, I was a young preacher just getting started, but I looked at this little gathering, and I looked at you kids on the floor, and he said, you were barefooted, nine years old, and he said, I, I looked at the others, and I, I thought this message could not be from God. It is not possible that such a thing could be. He said, I looked at the people. Sister McLaughlin had, I think, seven children. She was about 55 years old. It was no way possible she would ever do such a thing. My grandmother was that age or older. She would not do such a thing, and on and on. And he said, I looked at you boys, and I thought, God, it just could not be. <laughs> it's impossible. And, uh, but it was possible. God did do great and mighty things. And you here today, I do not know the one or the ones, but some here God could use. Now, Satan will do everything within his power to stop that. He is set against you to stop you, to hinder you, to keep you from rising to your full potential in Christ Jesus, whatever it may be. And he's, he'll, he'll do all. He's evil. He's wicked. He hates you. He despises you. He hates this college. He hates these teachers. He hates me. He hates what we stand for. But that's fine. I know where he stands. <laughs> I don't have any doubt about it. And we don't have any love for him either. And so the feelings are somewhat mutual. And, but he'll do all he can to put roadblocks in your path to put obstacles in your path, to hinder you. Now, but the facts are you can do anything you ought to do. Really, the responsibility is on your shoulders when you get right down to it. Dr. Gray said a moment ago that few times in history does something like this happen and take place. You are privileged, and I don't say that because where you are, but I say it because I believe God has put all of this together. We give all the praise, all the glory to him. He's put it together for a work and a cause that I believe in the, if Jesus tarries in this last end day revival that's going to touch this world. I believe that. We can do a lot, but we cannot do it all. We can provide a setting that maybe cannot be provided by the help and grace of God anywhere else in this world today. And it's up to you, the rest of it. Now, first of all, I'll say it, and I'll have to say it all quickly. You can't do anything without Jesus. You can forget it. I don't care how much talent you have, how much ability you have, how much personality you have, how slick you are, how smart, how glib you are. I don't care how much of an IQ that you have. I don't care where you came from, how much money your parents have or don't have. I don't care. You can't do anything for God without Jesus Christ. He's got to be the supreme one within your life. All right, now, too many fail. I go into church after church after church. I see pastor after pastor. I see evangelist after evangelist. Only a few succeed. What do you mean by succeed? I mean rise to their full potential. I'm not saying we, we measure success by the size of the Sunday school or the size of the crowds or the size of this or the size of that. But I mean they rise to their full potential. Only a few do. That's sad. 
but only a few rise to that total full potential. Sad to say, most fail. Now that sounds negative, but it's the truth. And it's not because God ordains failure. He's not a failure God. He is a victorious God. He has never failed at anything. You say, well, this world's a mess. Yes, but he's not through yet. He will not fail. And I'll tell you the reasons very quickly why preachers fail, why people fail, why anyone fails. And I'll go through them hurriedly. Number one, we fail as we start out. And anything starting new is wonderful providing it's on the right track. This college is new. We can chart our course. We don't have to tear up things that somebody has mislaid. You are, most of you are young. Your life is ahead of you. And the course you chart is by and large up to you. Number one, we fail because we do not admit that the failure is ours. You get me? We lay the blame on everybody else. If so-and-so would have done so-and-so, if that had been, if other things had happened, if he had not done this, if they had not done that, if I had had this chance, if I could have done this, so-and-so, I blame is placed on others. We fail because we refuse to admit that the failure is ours and not someone else's. And if you do that, you're going to go through life the same way, blaming somebody else for your problems. Start out this year, no matter what happens. It may not be your fault, but take it anyway. You will come out a million times better. I have come into church and church, church after church, Francis and I, nearly 30 years of evangelistic work. And, and uh, about 17 of them in churches, local churches. And sometimes the people didn't want revival, could not care less. The preacher was more interested in fishing than he was in having a move of God. And it would have been very easy to say, well, we can't have revival because the people don't pray. And the preachers get together, and um, at least they get together and say the people don't pray. And the people get together and say we don't have revival because the preachers won't pray. And then uh, everybody gets together and say we can't have revival because nobody prays. But I, I took the position that failure was there because it was my fault. I never blamed pastors. I never blamed deacons. I never blamed churches. I never blamed people. God, if we had a failure and the meeting didn't move, Jimmy Swaggart took it. It's my fault, God. Sometimes it wasn't. A lot of times it wasn't. But it made me lay on my face and cry and pray and sob and weep. And sometimes we pull revival out of what looked like it wouldn't be revival. But the temptation will always be there to say, it's their fault and it's not mine. But we fail because we refuse to admit the failures ours. This city right here is 67% Catholic. And I don't mean just Catholic. I mean Catholics that, 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 that Haitian Catholic, voodoo Catholic. That if they, if they walk into a church like this, and that's passé, but they'll fall over dead. Because a priest has put a hex on them. And you can't build a church in this city. Nobody ever had. And you can easily say it's impossible. And they don't like Jimmy Swaggart here. You won't, when you walk into stores and, and you say, well, I go to Jimmy Swaggart Bible College, some of them will say, where? The biggest television station in town has used $100 million worth of power to try to run us out of town. The only newspaper in the city, the morning and the night and the Sunday, all of it owned the one powerful conglomerate, has done everything within their power to choke us to death and stop us. Got on television for as long as an hour at a time 
trying to convince the city we're crooks and thieves and ought to be run out of the state. But whenever there is opposition, the grace of God shines bigger and greater and more powerful than ever before. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whenever it doesn't move, I say, Jimmy Swaggart, you missed it somewhere. Not these men, but this one. You may not always be at fault, but take the blame and you'll come out a hundred times better. Got to hurry. Secondly, we not only fail because we do not admit that failure is ours, we fail because we just can't stand success. Do you realize that success has killed about as many people as failure has? Most preachers, most people cannot stand success. Some of you young fledging preachers, you'll preach a while, and after a while, God will honor you to touch you one time, and you'll get anointed. It won't happen much. And you will walk out of there with your chest out there bumping those poles when you walk by. But remember, God has some rice on the floor for you. I talked to Gordon Lindsay many times. I said, Brother Lindsay, why did the great divine healing revival, what happened to those men? I was in a restaurant in Dallas, left the table, a little hamburger place somewhere there after service one night years ago. Walked up to use the telephone, pay telephone, a man came up to me, dirty, bedraggled, hair unkempt, uncombed, unshaven, old dirty coat. He looked like a bum. He was a bum. And he came up to me. And I didn't know who he was. He said, you're Jimmy Swagger, aren't you? I said, yes. He just stood there. I said, is there something I can do for you? He said, you don't know me. I said, no, I don't. He broke and started weeping, and then he told me his name, and when he did, I liked to have fallen over. He had once commanded some of the largest crowds in the nation. He had preached to thousands. Back during the great divine healing move, when the great tents were stretched, and in those days, five, eight, and 10,000 was an awful lot of people. And people were saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit, but it was like that. He really didn't pay the price for it. And he couldn't stand the success, and it went to his head, and he lost it. With tears, bleary, bloodshot, now he was a drunk. He took my hand, and I've never forgotten that, a derelict, a castaway. And he said, Please, don't do what I did. And I've never forgotten that. It shook me. It shook me to the soles of my shoes. That was back before this organization. It takes this year $105 million to pay the bills. We're involved in 140 nations of the world. There are not many denominations, only two that I know of in this, in this nation that have larger missions programs than we do. And I've never forgotten that man because it can happen. Thirdly, not only do we fail because we refuse to admit the failure is ours or because we can't stand success, should that come to some of you, but we fail because we can't stand defeat. Brother Greenaway mentioned that last night, graphically so. And brother, you're going to fail. Let me tell you the difference. I've got just a few minutes. Let me tell you the difference between faith and faithlessness, faith or doubt. There is so little difference in faith and doubt. I mean, it's not enough difference to hardly find. 
You say, well, I've got faith, and this is the age of faith. We'll do big things. Faith falls as flat of its face as doubt does. If you think you're going to have faith and it's going to be smooth sailing, some of the preachers have tried that and it didn't work. Confess it and possess it, name it and claim it, believe it and receive it. Well, after a while, you confess it and you don't possess it, or you do possess it and wish you didn't possess it. You name it and you don't claim it or get it. But there's so little difference there. The only difference in faith and doubt is doubt quits and faith refuses to quit. If you think faith means, buddy, I've got faith and it'll never be another problem. I like what Dr. Gray said yesterday. Once you get in the will of God, that's when the problems really start. Because that's when Satan says, boys, bring up the big guns. He's found the key. Let's stop him. Faith falls flat of its face, just like doubt does. With its face in the muck and the dust and the mud. Knock flat of your face. And Satan standing over you saying, I've got you, you'll never make it. I told you you were worth nothing. And doubt just lays there and says it's hopeless and doesn't get up and it can't be done. But faith gets up. It may stagger and stumble like a little calf with spindly legs, but it gets up wobble and all. And says, I'm going to make it by the help and grace of God, whatever it takes to do it. I know what I'm talking about. I have walked countless times outside of a television studio and weep and say, God, we can't do it with the oppressive powers of hell so strong that you could walk on them. I know what it is to stand up and preach. We used to have fellowship meetings years ago. I don't know, do they still have them? I don't know, but we had them in this state years ago. Now, I remember one morning preaching at one of those fellowship meetings 25 years ago when the people started laughing at me, not with me, but at me. And man, if you, you talk about wanting to quit, you talk about feeling humiliated. But you can't stand defeat. That's been my biggest problem. I can't stand defeat. I can't stand it. I, I've never really had a problem with success. I don't know if I have success or not, but that's never been a problem with me. I've never had a problem admitting when the failure was mine. But my biggest problem is I can't stand defeat. I, I just can't. I can't stand weaklings. That's my weakness. <laughs> I can't stand weaklings. I, I can't stand whiners. I can't stand. Have you ever noticed how whiners are? They doubt always talks like that. I can't stand that. We've got some of the, God's going to help us to get some beautiful appointments in this place. But some of you won't make it. You'll leave because you can't stand the humidity. <laughs> My Lord, God's looking for champions, going for the gold, and you can't even stand the humidity. <laughs> this is the best you're ever going to have it. You think you got problems and difficulties? This is the best you're ever going to have it. When we turn you loose, we're turning you loose to the lions. When we turn you loose, we're turning you loose to boys that play for keeps. They're not patting you on the back and, and, and molly calling you. They're going to look at you and if it doesn't work, they're going to shove you over. And you're going to have to have the goods. You're going to have to get up when you fall until God gets sick of looking at you and said, boys, you might as well help him because he's not quitting. He can't stand defeat. Uh, 
I've got five minutes. I've got to hurry here. To, to, not, to not experience defeat, some will resort to anything. I'm an evangelist. That's my calling. There probably aren't a hundred in the world of real, real, true, God-called evangelists. There are many good godly pastors that are serving as evangelists, and that's good. But I mean men that have been called of God to be an evangelist. Not many. When Francis and I started, I would watch some evangelists do some certain things, and it would gather the crowds for a while. I would watch them go into the tooth-filling business. Some of you young ones, you don't know what I'm talking about, but that was big in my day. They would, you've got gold over there, and God gave you gold, and you're not good enough, so he gave you silver, and some of you, he just gave pig iron down there. <laughs> That's foolishness. That's manipulation. That's exploitation. And God can't stand his preachers to exploit people. I watched them come up that, that leg lengtheners. Man, everybody was sitting in chairs and swiveling hips, saying, in the name of Jesus, look at it grow. And they would get a crowd for a while. But it was exploitation because it wasn't real. Does God lengthen a leg? Well, sure, God can do anything. But uh, for every leg he's lengthened, I would rather see him heal a cancer. I won't get involved in all of that. Others falling out. You believe in people falling out? I believe in it. Certainly I do. But preachers, some of them made a ministry out of it. And it became exploitation. They were exploiting the people. It's your job to develop the people, not exploit them. I gained, I gained the position that whenever people started believing in me, and if God helps you to get to that place to where that an awful lot of people started believing in what I said, and it would have been very easy to have suggested certain things, and they would have done it, but I knew in my heart of hearts it would have weakened them instead of strengthened them. Can God trust you with his power and with his glory? Because you will hold as a preacher of the gospel, if you are a preacher, a tremendous power. And if you misuse it, and thousands misuse it, especially evangelists, misuse it for the momentary glory. Ole and Trotter told me, boy, specialize in the word. Stick to the word. Preach the word. Last of all, and I've just barely skimmed this, we not only fail because we refuse to admit the failure is ours or because we can't stand success or because we can't stand defeat, but we fail because we have no burden. This is no joke. If you're here for a lark, a game, if this is playtime in the Southland, just a lark, you won't make it. The crying need, let me tell you this, you may be a great orator or you may not. You may have tremendous, overwhelming, commanding pulpit presence or you may not if you're a preacher. But if you have a burden, that's the key. A burden and brother... The devil's going to find out real quick if you're playing games or you really mean it. A burden to where you weep over the lost. And I thank God last night for what I saw because I believe the Lord has sent us the cream. I saw young men and young ladies weeping and sobbing before God. That's the answer. In weeks to come, I'm going to drill it into you about your prayer life, the study of the Word. There are no shortcuts. You can't confess it down and it's all here. There's a price to pay for it. But God can use you and will use you.
praise the name of the Lord. I've given you four little things. We fail because we do not admit the failure is ours. We fail because we can't stand success. Success. We fail because we can't stand defeat. We fail because we have no burden. And you can do what you ought to do if you'll have that fellowship with God. You can do it. You'll have to be abound. You'll have to abound sometimes, and you'll have to learn how to be abased. But you can do it. I want you to stand with me. And I'm going to ask Dr. Gray to come up here. And in this catalog that gives some pertinent things about this Bible college, on one of the pages there's a lifestyle covenant. And I'm going to quote it today. And I'm going to ask you to repeat it after me and believe it with everything within you and with all of your heart because we think it's tremendously important. And I'll ask Dr. Gray to lead you in your part. And I want you to say it. It can come from your lips or it can come from your heart. It says this. I covenant to seek the Lord's guidance, I to seek the Lord's guidance. Through, daily personal prayer and Bible study. through daily personal prayer and Bible study, and by faithfully attending daily chapels, and, by faithfully attending daily chapels. and, weekly, church services. and weekly church services. Number two, I covenant to be faithful and punctual. In attending all class sessions and other academic gatherings. All class sessions and other academic gatherings. Constantly, seeking to be diligent Constantly seeking to be diligent. In developing the full potential, developing the full potential of, my mind. of my mind. Number three. I covenant to practice good health. And physical, fitness and physical fitness by getting appropriate rest and exercise, appropriate rest and, exercise. and by observing a balanced diet. diet. Number four, I covenant before God, covenant before God to, embrace to embrace and to hold a life of personal holiness. Refraining from, sinful practices, refraining from sinful practices and observing the college and biblical standard, and the and biblical standard of dress and, appearance. dress and appearance. Number five, I covenant to be mindful and diligent, I to be mindful and diligent in properly handling all business and financial, responsibilities. and financial responsibilities. Number six, I covenant to be continually involved in ministry, always looking for and using every opportunity <laughs> to minister and to teach, to proclaim and bless Others for, Christ Jesus. Others for Christ Jesus. Number seven. I covenant to walk in humility toward others. And live in submission to those in authority. Obeying all college rules and regulations. And always manifesting a cooperative and teachable attitude. I have carefully and prayerfully made this covenant before God and these people. And by God's help and grace, I do solemnly promise by His help in the name of Jesus to carry it out to the best of my ability.
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Hasn't this been a wonderful time this morning? Praise the Lord. I don't believe that God wants any of us to be a failure. God wants us to be successful. I remember, I remember that during the time that we were setting up the admissions process, the administrators and I developed an administrative principle. And that principle of admissions was this. We don't want anyone to come here who can't be successful. And we believe by God's grace that you are here and you can be successful in what God has called you to do. And we believe it with you. Hallelujah. We believe it. Amen. Father, we thank you that we've had this time to be together. We thank you, Lord, for this message and for this challenge from Brother Swaggart. And Father, we do sincerely commit ourselves to the task at hand, to the work of God, to the life of holiness, to be diligent in all things, to be cooperative and submitted in our relationships. We believe, Father, that this is going to be a great year, a great year in college, a great year in a Bible college, and we know, God, that you're going to bless our students and our faculty as we move forward in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. Let's give the Lord a praise, shall we? Hallelujah.